Today's podcast is brought to you by Hypervape. Hypervape.com. Sleek, discreet, and reliable. That's H Y P R V A P E. Hypervape.com. Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode will explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past, we'll delve into the folklore of the times, and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is episode 16. It's been said that behind every great man is an even greater woman. And maybe that is true for those stalwarts of the Old West, such as Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp. For Holliday, it was Big Nose Kate, a woman almost as cantankerous and quick to anger as her male counterpart. And Wyatt Earp had his Josephine, the woman who helped shape the legend of the man we know today. Of course, Wyatt had other women in his life, but it was Josephine who stood beside him through his darkest days and stayed by his side up and until his death. These two women figured prominently in the lives of the two best-known gunfighters of the Old West, but the women remain relatively unknown. Each had their own stories, which are often overshadowed by the famous men they loved. This episode of the Drift and Ramble podcast is one for the ladies, as we focus on the women behind the men of Tombstone. Doc Holliday was said to have only one love in his life, and that was Kate. But according to author and historian Glenn Davis, Kate wasn't Doc's first love, and this revelation was news to me. In the book titled Love and Danger in the Old West, Mr. Davis describes the still teenage Holiday and his first cousin, Martha Ann Maddie Holiday, having a love affair, one that Maddie's parents disapproved of. Though it wasn't uncommon for cousins to marry in the South at the time, Maddie's devout Catholic parents prevented their relationship from continuing. This forced the two to correspond through letters, a correspondence that continued up and until Doc's final days. Maddie became a Catholic nun and ultimately Mother Superior, while Holiday went on to become one of the West's wildest characters. But today's story is all about the woman commonly referred to as Big Nose Kate. Mary Catherine Haroni was born on November 7, 1850, in Hungary. She was the second oldest daughter of a Hungarian physician named Miklos Horoni. It's been said the family moved to Mexico, as Mary Catherine's father had accepted a position as surgeon for Maximilian. There is little doubt that Kate received a first-class education and lived a somewhat privileged life. Eventually, the family moved to the United States, settling in Iowa. Her father and stepmother both died shortly thereafter, and only a month apart. Mary Catherine and her siblings were then placed in the care of her brother-in-law, but Kate wasn't enjoying her new life in a foster home. She ran off and stowed away aboard a riverboat bound for Missouri. In St. Louis, she later claimed to have met and married a dentist named Silas Melvin. She claims they had a son together, but both her son and her husband died from yellow fever. Though no official records substantiate this claim, there was indeed a Silas Melvin found in census records at the time, 
but he was married to someone else. Another man named Melvin worked in an asylum in St. Louis. So the possibility exists that Kate had confused some facts about her past as she recalled them later in her life. Kate was a dance hall girl or a prostitute, depending on the language you want to use. And while her occupation may seem incongruous for someone with a good education and time spent at a convent, some might say she didn't have much of a choice. In an example used by Mr. Davis in his book, women, specifically unmarried women, had very few opportunities to earn a decent living in St. Louis at the time. Kate could either work a 12-hour day as a seamstress or at a laundry for as little as $25 a month or she could work as a prostitute for about $50 a night. Hi, Sugar. Aren't you new in town? Looking for some company? Documents recently uncovered by researcher Jan Collins show that Mary Catherine Haroni was working as a prostitute as early as 1869 and that she was working for Madame Blanche Tribol in St. Louis. In 1874, Kate was fined for working as a sporting woman in a sporting house in Dodge City, Kansas. Incidentally, the brothel she was fined in was being run by Bessie Earp, James Earp's wife. Yes, he was Wyatt Earp's older brother. As you may recall from episode 15 of this podcast, we learned that Wyatt Earp was frequently involved in the flesh trade and was known to be, at least at one point, in business with his brother Jim's wife. But Kate, using the alias of Kate Elder, made a fateful move to Fort Griffin, Texas in 1876, and it was here where she would meet the deadly dentist, Doc Holliday, with whom she would forever be associated. It was during this same time and place that Doc met up with Wyatt Earp. Though it's unclear if Earp knew Kate prior to meeting Holliday, the possibility exists. Based on documentation placing Wyatt Earp in the brothel business with his sister-in-law Bessie, Big Nose Kate and Wyatt Earp could have known each other long before Doc Holliday entered the picture. It's been said that Doc considered Kate to be his intellectual equal, and there's no doubt the two had something special in common, but the same spark that ignited their passions also ignited their alcohol-fueled disagreements which were said to be loud, frequent, and sometimes violent. Kate Elder, a.k.a. Big Nose Kate, was actually quite attractive. Her nose was not that big. The moniker of Big Nose Kate actually came from her being nosy. She liked to stick her nose into other people's business. Kate was outspoken, strong-willed, and extremely independent. She, like Doc, did not back down from a fight. In one incident, Doc would come to appreciate his new love's temperament as more of a blessing than a curse. Doc had been playing cards with a man named Ed Bailey, but Bailey kept looking at the discarded cards to see what they were, a clear violation of the rules of the game. Doc warned Bailey not to monkey with the deadwood. Fella, you want to keep monkeying with that deadwood or play cards? <laughs> But Bailey continued to test Doc's patience. Bailey had a reputation as a bully around town, and it wasn't out of character for him to test Doc's mettle. Finally, Doc had enough and raked the pot, or took all the money, which was the right thing to do. When someone continuously breaks the rules as Bailey was doing, they automatically forfeit the game. So, Doc was in his rights to rake the pot, but Bailey didn't think so and he stood up and drew his gun. Before Bailey could pull the trigger, however, Doc was on his feet, knife drawn, and he cut Bailey wide open, spilling his guts all over the floor of John Shancy's saloon. But Doc was confident of his righteous use of deadly force. Seeing as how the man, now dead and sprawled across the card table, had pulled a gun on Doc first, Doc sat back down and waited for the marshal to arrive. But Doc was taken by surprise, however, when the marshal placed him under arrest anyway and took him to the town hotel for safekeeping. At the time, 
Fort Griffin had no jail, so there weren't many options. While Doc sat idle in his hotel room jail cell, Bailey's friends got ready to show Doc some hemp justice. String him up! Hang him! Let's show him some hemp justice! While they prepared for a lynching, Kate was taking action of her own. She stole two horses and started a fire in an old barn to create a distraction. With fire being a serious threat to nearby buildings, the entire town came out to douse the flames, while Kate confronted the lone man left to guard Doc with a pistol. She leveled her gun at the man and demanded his weapon before getting him to open the door to free Doc. The two outlaw lovebirds left Fort Griffin, Texas in a hurry, never to return again. In her later years, Kate denied taking part in any such mischief, but she may have been playing it cool. The penalty for stealing a horse in those days was often the death penalty, and it's likely she could have hung just for having helped a criminal escape justice. Kate was simply protecting herself from prosecution by denying the story. Historians looking for proof of such crime wound up stumped. But according to Mr. Davis's research, there was no courthouse to record the crime and no newspaper to report it. Regardless of the reason, the couple left Fort Griffin, Texas, just as Doc had left so many towns before, under a thick cloud of dust and suspicion. The couple returned to Dodge City and registered as Mr. and Mrs. J. H. Holliday at Deacon Cox's boarding house, as we mentioned in episode 14. Here, Doc tried to revive his dental practice, but spent most of his time gambling and drinking. Kate, meanwhile, returned to her old ways as well, and she began to frequent the saloons and dance halls of Dodge City. Well, ain't you a tall drink of water? Want to come up and see my room? Kate and Doc's love affair was a lot like gasoline and matches. Both of them drank to excess, and both of them had big mouths and bad tempers. They would fight, reconcile, and fight again, until one or the other would storm off or move out. John Henry Holiday, you better come in here and pick up these boots off the floor. I'm so tired of picking up after your laziness. Oh, now, Kate, can't you just let a man relax in his own home? Pick them boots up, Doc, before I stick them where the sun don't shine. Kate, don't threaten me. You know I don't take kindly to threats. What are you going to do, shoot me, you drunken old fool? I would if I could find my damn pistols. It was during one of these spats when Doc had had enough and he tossed old Kate out on the street. Stubborn, ferocious, and independent, Kate landed on her feet and kept moving. The two were separated for a time and then reunited. Some say in Dodge, others say in Las Vegas, New Mexico and still others point to Prescott, Arizona. Regardless of where they rekindled their love, it didn't take long for them to fall back into their old habits. Doc with his card games and Kate with her Johns. The cycle of fighting and making up was no secret to anyone but newcomers to the town of Tombstone. John Henry, are you drunk again? How many times have I told you about coming in here seeing double? Just quit your yammering, woman. I done seen you drink plenty tonight, too. <laughs> now, at least I didn't go jumping in the sack with half the town folks. Get out and stay out, you flea-bitten old cow. Tensions were mounting between the Earps and the Cochise County Cowboys. There was a stagecoach robbery, and innocent men lost their lives. Sheriff Johnny Behan and Wyatt Earp had bad blood between them, too. The two lawmen lusted after the same woman, a woman by the name of Josephine Marcus. Behan wanted Earp out of his way, and he saw an opportunity with Earp's friend, Doc. If Doc was charged with the robbery of the stagecoach, Behan would look more like a real sheriff and not the ineffectual lawman he actually was. Behan's ties to the criminal element were so close he needed a distraction, in the form of Doc, to keep the public 
and other law enforcement agencies from looking too deeply at his own affairs. If Doc's downfall hurt Wyatt Earp in the process, that wasn't collateral damage so much as it was two birds with one stone. Kate showed up drunk at the Oriental Saloon, still angry over a fight she had just had with Doc. Milt Joyce, the saloon's owner, kept the drinks coming, while Sheriff Behan convinced her to sign a sworn statement implicating Doc in the stagecoach robbery. She signed, but upon sobering up, she recanted her story and told the judge she had been under the influence at the time of the statement foiling Behan's plan. Of course, Doc had an alibi for his whereabouts anyway, but Behan never tired of taking a cheap shot at Holiday and the Earps. When Doc learned what Kate had done, they fought again, and this time he gave her some money and told her to leave town. But Kate defied Doc's orders. Though some historians disagree and say she did leave town, if she had continued to stay with Doc at Fly's boarding house in Tombstone, Arizona, this would have given her a front-row seat to the gunfight at the O.K. Corral. From the room in which she and Doc rented, the view over the area where the gunfight took place was unobstructed. And Kate did claim to witness the fight, or at least a portion of it. We know that Doc threw down the shotgun Virgil had given him by Kate's eyewitness account. She thought the gun had a malfunction, but we later learned that it was Doc's preference for his own pistols over the shotgun that Virgil had handed him. Kate may not have seen the entire fight. One of the stray bullets hit a window pane just above where she would have been standing, so she probably ducked, flinched, or fell to the ground, as I probably would have done during an actual gunfight. When the gunfight was over, she reported Doc coming back to his room and being very upset. She states that he wept and said, It was awful. Just awful. If Doc was emotional after the fight, he sure wasn't described that way during it. According to the Tombstone Epitaph on the day after the gunfight, they wrote that Doc was as calm as if he was at target practice and fired rapidly. Soon after the gunfight at the O.K. Corral, Doc and Kate separated once again. Doc stayed in Tombstone to ride with Wyatt Earp's posse after Virgil Earp was shot and Morgan Earp was assassinated. Meanwhile, Kate moved to Globe, Arizona and opened up a boarding house for minors. She operated a brothel and hotel and later lived in Pinal and Silver King. Doc and Wyatt rode off on that now-famous Vendetta ride, but when it was over, the men stayed in Colorado. By now, Doc's health was beginning to fail, and his gambling began to suffer. In August of 1884, Doc had his last known gunfight, and it happened because he was broke. The fight was over a $5 loan made by a man named Billy Allen. And you may recall that in episode 14, we learned that Doc was unable to pay the loan back. Fearing he would be killed over the debt, Doc shot Billy Allen in the arm, knowing that he would fare better in court with an assault charge than with a charge of murder. Billy survived, and Doc was eventually acquitted. During the trial, witnesses agreed with Doc's version of the story and claims of self defense. Doc testified about his diminished health, stating that, I knew that I would be as a child in his hands if he got a hold of me. <coughs> I weigh 122 pounds. I think Alan weighs about 170. I've had pneumonia three or four times. I don't think I was able to protect myself against him. As Doc's condition grew worse, he moved to Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Kate, in the meantime, had done all right for herself. She got word of Doc's failing health, and in May of 1887, she traveled to Glenwood Springs to visit with Doc. The couple stayed together in a cabin owned by Kate's brother in Redstone. But Doc grew worse, 
and they returned to Glenwood Springs, where Doc would die November 8, 1887. Kate came through for Doc in his final days, and she may have even provided financial support, since Doc had long since run out of money. Doc's first love, Maddie, had kept in touch with Doc through all the years, and Doc, that sentimental old cuss, had saved all her letters. They were found among Doc's possessions after his death. Even though Doc's father was still alive, it was Maddie who received the death notification for Doc, and she, in turn, notified the Holiday family. Maddie also received all of Doc's possessions, including those letters that Doc had saved. Maddie, it turned out, had saved all her letters from Doc as well. Kate continued to live a long life, which is somewhat surprising, considering her intimacy with Doc and the fact that he had tuberculosis, a highly contagious, easily transmittable disease. Kate lived until she was 89, and she died November 2, 1940, just five days short of her 90th birthday. In the later years of her life, many writers had contacted her, wanting to write about her life with Doc Holliday, but none were willing to pay her for the story. When Kate died, a letter she had written was found in her room, detailing what she had witnessed from her room at Fly's boarding house during that fateful October afternoon in Tombstone. Hold up there, partner. The Drift and Ramble podcast will be right back. There goes old Sally Maples. She's so dumb she couldn't teach a hen to cluck. Her husband ain't so bright neither. He's as dull as dishwater. If all his brains was dynamite, there wouldn't be enough to blow his nose. He is plumb weak north of his ears. He can't tell skunks from house cats. His family tree was a shrub. You boys got nothing better to do than to sit out here and insult everybody that goes by. Oh, hi, Sheriff. We didn't see you standing there. Sheriff, we was fixing to have a smoke, but my matches done got wet, and I'll be damned if I can't light one. You know, instead of sitting outside the general store insulting everybody, you could go inside and buy yourself a Hypervape vaporizer. Hypervape is the finest quality made. Why don't you invest in the best? Hypervape.com. That's H-Y-P-R-V-A-P-E. Hypervape.com. A great many resources were used in compiling this episode. Though every effort has been made to provide an accurate account, some discrepancies may arise. I'd like to acknowledge the following resources. Love and Danger in the Old West by Glenn Davis. History.net. Wikipedia.org. Lady at the OK Corral. The True Story of Josephine Marcus Earp by Ann Kirshner. Kathy Weiser Alexander and the Legends of America website, legendsofamerica.com. The Drift and Ramble podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and just about anywhere else podcasts are found. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and now on patreon.com, where you can find details on how to access exclusive content. You can get all the details at patreon.com slash drift and ramble. That's patreon.com slash drift and ramble. Thank you for your support. Thanks to Audio Oblivious Productions and their cast for helping me bring this episode to life. Hi, this is Steve. And this is Cheryl. From the Drift and Ramble podcast. We wanted to say a few words about the Pottern family's first year anniversary. Happy anniversary, Potter and family. Woohoo! I hope there's cake. <laughs> when we started this podcast, we really didn't have any idea what we're doing, and 
now that we've been doing it for, I don't know, what, 12 episodes or something, we still have no idea what we're doing. But we found Potter and Family all by, kind of by accident. And when we found it, we didn't know that, uh, you know, it was going to do us any good or what it even meant or whether or not I could even start to use it. But here's what I did. I said, oh, let me use this, this hashtag because uh, it says Potter and Family, and that's kind of cool. And maybe, maybe somebody will listen to the show. So I started adding it to all of my tweets. And um, it seemed like almost overnight, the Potter and Family hashtag turned things around for us. And then we started getting people retweeting us and talking about the show and saying, this is great. Oh, my God, we've never heard anything like this. And I thought, what the hell is wrong with these people? But it was working, so why question it? Say something nice about Potter and Family, Cheryl. Like Steve said, the best thing about Potter and Family, of course, is the people. And we've only been at this for, what, five, six months now? So, you know, way shorter time than Potter and Family's been around. So we almost really don't know what podcasting is without the Potter and Family. Potter and Family is finding us new listeners. Potter and Family is finding us new friends. Potter and Family is finding us people that appreciate podcasts, which is probably the coolest thing about Potter and Family. Now, getting back to Potter and Family, it is an anniversary celebration, and we'd like very much to participate in that celebration. We hope there's alcohol. We hope there's some sort of inebriatory substance being passed around. Inebriatory? Uh, is, is that a word? In, inebriatory? Well, it is now. What, <laughs> what I would recommend is that you use the Potter and Family hashtag to sample a couple of podcasts every day. You're bound to find one you like, but I'm not going to mention any names because, well, that wouldn't be fair to the ones that I don't mention. God, this, this just took a turn. <laughs> <laughs> this just got weird. All right. Well, I don't know what to, t- what to say about Potter and Family, except that Potter and Family has contributed greatly to the success of our show. And we really appreciate that. And we'll continue to be Potter and Family members no matter what happens. And we've met uh, great people who are willing to participate, provide some guidance and assistance with everything from not only just producing podcasts, but, you know, where to host your show, um, what are some good tactics to take in promoting the show. Um, it, it's just been a, a, it really has been a family. And so, you know, if the, if the theory is it takes a village, well, then uh, this is one village that we definitely uh, want to be part of. Not like that other village that we don't want to be part of. Well, yet we did have to leave after the incident. What's our show about? People are going to hear this and they're going to go, well, Potter and Family, that's great. Okay, cool. Who are these people talking and what, what do they do? We are, once again. The Drift and Ramble podcast. I mean, what kind of a crappy name is that? I mean, Drift and, and Ramble. That's pretty much any conversation I have. Well, I think that's how the podcast got its name. Oh, and what's it about? It's True Stories and American Legends. Okay, so true stories in American legends about what? Mostly about things that happened in the Wild West in the old-timey days. Well, that sounds boring. Any any redeeming qualities to the show? Is there a lot of witty banter like what's happening here right now? No. Oh. Okay, so that's our show. and uh, You can listen to the Drift and Ramble podcast every second Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so sorry. I would like to say a huge thank you to Potter and Family for all their assistance in helping with our show and for introducing us to all the great podcasters out there who have been so uh, welcoming. And uh, it's just been a great experience. And we love Potter and Family, and we uh, look forward to being a part of the Potter and Family for many, many years to come. We love to hear from fans of our show. One way you can really help us out is to leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Here are a couple of recent reviews we've received on iTunes. Easily My Favorite Podcast by Party Naked. Five stars. Wonderful show for lovers of old Western tales or storytelling in general. Steve and Cheryl have crafted something wonderful here. I also highly suggest the extended content on Patreon.
On the next episode of the Drift and Ramble podcast, we'll look at the life and times of Josephine Marcus, the woman that Wyatt Earp would spend the rest of his life with. Until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzen. See you at the next installment of the Drift and Ramble podcast. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production, hosted and produced by Steve Blizzen, with segment research and voice acting by Cheryl Blizzen. Additional contributions and content have been made possible by support from individuals dedicated to the art and science of storytelling and exploring the still fertile promise of the American West. Oh no! Huh?